Welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk about the first ever match they attended. And I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Jim Piddock. And it's not just because he's a Palace fan. He's got quite a pedigree. Uh, Jim, actor, writer, producer, moved to the US way back in 1981. So there's over 40 years of experience in a variety of roles in film and television. As an actor, he's appeared in blockbusters such as Independence Day and Lethal Weapon 2. He's written and produced an array of TV series, including the HBO BBC series Family Tree. Not content with this, he's also written a book called Caught With My Pants Down, which is a wry memoir of his time in Hollywood. So, Jim... Pleasure to have you on board, and unusually for guests on this podcast, your first match was an away match, an FA Cup tie at the Valley in January 1969. Please yes. tell us about it. Yes, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, it, would do, it also tells you how old I am. Um, <coughs> I'm not quite sure how it came. I, I, I support, supported Palace, started supporting Palace in 68. I think it was early 68. And um, and I kind of begged my uh, father to take me to a game, um, but he he wasn't really into football and uh, he didn't like crowds. So uh, right, it, not a great um, start. Um, so I, I don't know how it ended up that that would be the first game. It was probably a Christmas treat rather than going. Uh, so I was too old for Panto at that point. Um, I think I was twelve um, and. Uh, and I, I, it's quite late, really. It's, um, you know, it's like I lost my palace virginity quite late. A lot, a lot of people started when they were six, seven or eight. Um, but but I, I think probably because my, my my father was not really keen to do it. But he he kind of, um, he, he took one for the team and uh, took me to, to the game. And I guess it was probably because it was, we lived in Seven Oaks in Kent. It was probably marginally easier to get there. Or he knew that area better than going the other way um, yeah. and they were probably equidistant from where we lived so I had a choice really of Palace, Millwall or Charlton and I'd, I'd already chosen Palace um, and so um, to be honest with you I can't tell you exactly why that was the first game but I was thrilled to to, to go and it was in fact the only match I ever went to with my father um, and he had a, he was fine he had a okay time we, we stood at one end um, uh, I think against a, one of those what are they called? Not stanchions, those barrier things. And um, barriers, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, and he found a a, a a a guy who was around his age who was quite you know chatty, and they just chatted through the game, and I watched the game. So it was all kind of very civilized, and and I don't remember it being super crowded at that end. I mean, that ground was at that time had a capacity of seventy five thousand, which yeah, is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, it was one of the biggest grounds in England. Um, it's it, it had that one main stand with the Wrigley thing that was quite sort of well known. Then it had a sort of smaller stand at one end, which I think was where most of the Charlton sort of uh, massive at the, went. And then there was um, the, uh, an open end, which was where we were. I, yeah. I don't know if that was all the away fans. I can't remember. Probably was. And then there's one the other side of the pitch, a whole one side was was this all standing, but it was absolutely mammoth. I mean, yeah. it was a coliseum. So. I think there was plenty of room because I'm sure the crowd was probably, um, I don't know what the crowd was. It, it, it's probably uh, the 20 I haven't something. looked it up. It's, it was 32,324, so about half full, let's say. Wow. I mean, that's pretty good for two teams that were in then Division yeah. Two, which was championship. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, that's a pretty damn good crowd um, yeah. for, for that game. Um, and, yeah, Palace were wearing... Um, they are unusual. Well, it wasn't that unusual. Their, their away kit was blue shirts with a white trim. Mm -hmm. And I think they had, they used to wear red sh shorts or maybe white shorts. In that game, it was white shorts, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. So they, they weren't wearing their normal kit, which I guess they thought, I don't, I'm sure, but Charlton weren't either, I don't think, because they were wearing white. Yeah, I don't quite understand that because I looked into it and I, I, I sent you a picture earlier. Uh, of the game and Charlton for some unknown reason are wearing white shirts when their kit was always red yes yeah, red with white shorts white shorts so they seem to be wearing white 
with dark shorts. We're wearing what you said was blue. Obviously, it's a black and white picture, so I couldn't tell. But I think yeah. it was blue with white. I mean, just doesn't make. I mean, I I know people change their kits just for the whim now, so that they can sell more nowadays. But I'm not sure Charlton did that back in 1969. No, I, I don't need know. to get someone from Charlton to explain what was going on there. FA Cup. Uh, I mean, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that games were came really thick and fast. I mean, it's quite possible that both teams had played. I, 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 I could. I, I haven't got that in front of me. Um, you know, two days before, so they probably yeah. had no kit. They were the kit was being washed, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. Yes, yeah. and they were very uh, slow in those days of washing machines. Because interestingly, that my next two games were that season on April the 4th, which was home to Middlesbrough. That was my first home game that I went with a, a school friend. And that was nil-nil as well. I, my first two games were nil-nil. Um, yeah. But I was thrilled because we were in the front row of what the Arthur Waite was then just open standing. And there was a picture in Shoot magazine of some player leaning against a goalpost. I think it was actually a Middlesbrough player. And... Yeah. Um, and, and and me and my friend were in the. You could see us in the background. So I was I was thrilled. Oh, really? I made it into Shoot magazine on my second game. But that yeah. we, we drew nil nil. But then, bizarrely, we played the day after another um, Division Two game against Portsmouth that I went to yeah. as well. Uh, we won three one. So they, they literally. I think that must have been Good Friday, and then they played on the Saturday yeah. as well. It would have been an Easter thing, probably, wouldn't yeah. it? And and they used to, over Christmas, they used to play on Boxing Day and then the next day as well. It exactly. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that's, 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 that's probably what happened before that cup game on the 4th of January, that they'd had games, you know, either on New Year's Day or maybe the day after, and, and they the kit was still wet. Um, yeah. But the, the I think, interestingly, after that game, we only lost one game for the rest of the season yeah uh, i'm looking at cheat i've got my little cheat sheet yeah the 4th of january then we had we lost the replay the uh, cut replay nil. two nil at home and then after that in the league we went on an absolute tear and we played we lost one game in six 12 15 in about 20 games yeah we lost strong, one strong game. end strong end and we will come on to this because at the end of that season, Palace did reach the top flight for the first yeah. time in their history. But I want to whiz back on to the valley, as you said, that vast uh, side terracing. I, I, I went there when it was still around, and, and obviously it's completely different now. But it, it was just extraordinary the expanse, and I, I don't know how many people they could fit in it. Probably about. 35,000 but I would think yeah on that one side it's quite I think it must have been the biggest um certainly I mean in London if not beyond the biggest area because it was all standing it was just terracing yeah, so yeah. You, you could fit a lot of people in there not that necessarily Charlton would fill them sorry Charlton fans I, I, I didn't really mean that um so Let's go back to your dad. He wasn't a football man. It's amazing, actually, Jim, how many people on this pod who are generally football fans or in the world of football, I would say 75% of them have said their dad was never into it. I had to force my dad to take me. Similar yeah. for me, my dad was into rugby and cricket. He didn't really like football. He sort of, in the end, he said, OK, we'll, we'll take, I have an elder brother. So I went for his birthday for my first game. But he just doesn't, he had no interest. And he said, you know, off you go. You can go with your elder brother. That's it. Um, so when you said that was the only game you attended with your dad, partly because he didn't really get into football and partly because he hated crowds. So let's go a little bit further into that. And who did you start going with rather than your dad? Well, after that, you know, I, I mean, when I, once I was a teenager, I think they felt it was safe for me to go um, yeah. on my own um, or with, with friends. So, yeah, I went, second game was with a, a, a school friend who I'm actually still in touch with who lives in um, Santa Barbara, quite quite close to me in L.A. Um, yeah. And uh, and I think the third game that I did go on my own, I, I think. And then I started going regularly with 
I had two neighbours who lived up the street in a little village called Bessels Green in Kent, mm -hmm. and uh, Martin and Tim uh, Worstall, and, and we would get the bus together on a regular basis. You know, I was actually at boarding school, so during school hours I would mm -hmm. sometimes bunk off school. I get a, a little note from Matron saying I had asthma, so I would <laughs> avoid playing rugby. Um, yes. Once it was the, the, the what we called the Lent term, I would play... I was kind of a big football player, so and we we managed to get football into the curriculum while I was there. So uh, I would not get off games there, but during the rugby and the and, and the cricket, I, I don't know how you get off cricket through asthma, but I did. Um, right. So so we would just nip off and then be back in time for prep in the evening, which we had. Can't believe we had prep on Saturday evening. What a it's like living in prison, um, and then. Um, so I would do that occasionally, uh, but but during the the, the school uh, the, the holidays, I would go with with Martin and uh, Tim, and, and we would get the bus the four four o three by right. Tatsfield to West Croydon, and then uh, get another bus from West Croydon to the ground. Yeah, right. Um, so this, as you say, you started really supporting Palace in nineteen sixty eight. So a year before yeah. you went. Um, and did the, that was the start of, you know, the relationship and this relationship, let's face it, has been going on for 50 odd years now. So yeah. was it an immediate thing where you just went, yeah, I'm into this, I'm buying into this, this is me for life. Was there any wavering thinking, Oh, you say you had a choice, Charlton, Millwall, Palace, or you could have gone no. for one of the big clubs. No, there wasn't you know? one side chosen Palace, but but there was some wavering before. I fell in love with football. I didn't really like football until I was 10 years old. And oh. then the 1966 World Cup came, and uh, it was in the summer holidays. I had, I didn't have an awful lot going on. So I, I watched that first game, which was... <laughs> Against Uruguay, my first game obviously to be nil-nil. England against Uruguay, that woke up, I believe it was nil-nil. And then yeah. I became hooked on football. So, uh, and England won the World Cup. So by the end of that World Cup, I was absolutely fanatical. And because I loved Bobby Charlton, um, I thought he was just a, you know, an idol. Um, even though there were the three West Ham players there, I, I, I kind of tentatively supported Manchester United for about a year. But but sort of loosely at a distance, yeah. so I never went to see them, and and um, and then I was like, this is seems silly. I should support a team that I, that I'm near, yeah. and um, so what's the nearest club to me? I was quite sort of ruthless about that, and it was those three, and I I loved the name Crystal Palace. It sounded sort of exotic, yeah. and um, uh, and I liked the kit. And once I had made that choice, I, mean, I, I, I have a diary somewhere that I used to write, and, and, it, and it had uh, in that year, year of 68, I think it was January 68, it said, decided to support Crystal Palace today. And <laughs> honestly, once I'd made that decision, it was all in. I was literally all in. I would cut yeah. have out the reports. I, would, I was voracious. I was uh, obsessive about it. So no, once I had made that choice, I was all in on Palace, and uh, I immediately bought a kit, and uh, everything was Palace, Palace, Palace. I was, I was fanatical. Yeah. Well, I think once you've written it in your diary, you, you can't step back. Once that. you've written in those little tiny diaries, you know those ones that, that were oh, in the size of your hand. Um, I've got it somewhere, and I, I, I sort of yeah, wrote that down, um, yeah. amongst other boring things like. Woke up feeling unwell today, or oh, might have, have a had cold. a touch of asthma. I, I can't yeah, I had go a, to school. It faked <laughs> asthma again. Make them <laughs> convinced. Ultimately, yeah. I mean, I don't know why. It's pretty absolute rubbish. Um, yeah. I don't think one has an awful lot interesting to say at that age. Um, so, well, I didn't anyway. So yeah, yeah. now once it was, I was in, I was in, and and then it was kind of how could I get there and see as many games, and then as as I moved into my teens, you know, I would go to pretty much every home game. Um, it came became a bit of a problem when I was playing at university. Uh, I was playing on Saturdays, 
Yeah. So I, I didn't see so many games out. It would tend to be midweek games. But yeah, I mean, and I go to occasional away game. Um, and and then I, I guess I left England when I was 24. So by then I was, I was so far gone that every game I was I would be glued to my world service radio in those days for the results, uh, yeah. pacing the streets of New York or wherever I happened to be. <clears throat> so yeah, the, the famous sports report uh, tune would have got you, and you'd have, you'd have oh yeah listened into the as you say the what unfortunately now they don't have, which I think uh, is a real shame that they don't do the classified football results. Um, James Alexander Gordon, absolutely, uh, yeah, BBC World Service. That's what exactly. I used to. So yeah. Again, switching back to that game because we will we'll flip flop uh, between the two. So, <clears throat> Charlton obviously is a local rivalry for Palace. Um, mm. Did you did you sort of pick up any sense, any atmosphere of oh, th- these are actually not that keen on each other, or being quite young? Did you, did it all wash over you? I think back then it probably wasn't as bitter as it can be in the, you know... The latter no, it certainly season. wasn't. It certainly yeah. wasn't. And because our experience, I mean, the, 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 the guy we were talking to, or my father was talking to, was a Charlton fan. So yeah. he, he... And it was all very, very civilised. And um, I didn't... I don't think there was that kind of rivalry in the same way. I think with Millwall, it was different. I mean, Millwall, mm. that was really walking into the lion's den when you went there. And that was unpleasant. And uh, I've got some really bad memories of, of games which were ugly amongst the supporters. Um, but Charlton, I never felt that. And I always had a slight soft spot for Charlton. Um, I don't know why. I always thought they were quite a decent club. And, and then I think it got a bit sour when we shared a ground for a while. Yeah. And somehow the rivalry became more intense. And then obviously the Brighton thing took over, which again, um, I'm in a minority. I... I I don't like Brighton particularly, but I admire them. I, I, I don't, I still don't feel that like they're our main rivals. I feel Millwall are. Um, I, I uh, you know, well, yeah, I had this conversation the other day, like who, who, a group of us in our fifties and sixties, you know, what club do you really hate? And uh, it was funny. It was all different, you know, for, for Dean Williams, it was a lifelong Palace fan. It was Spurs. For Steve Broward, it was Chelsea. For me, it was Millwall. You know, we all had different, but but very few people, and a couple said Brighton, um, yeah. but I, but I, but I actually never I never felt particularly strongly one way or another about Brighton, and now I have nothing but admiration for for the way they run the club, um, as I do for Brentford. Um, I think yeah. they're extremely well run clubs, and uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit envious of the way Brighton have kicked on. Absolutely, um, yeah. I mean that I I. Went through the Brighton rivalry. There are many, many reasons for it. We know the the spark for it was actually Alan Mullery and yeah, yeah. the replay. That that it was, and also I think it was the fact why they overtook Charlton Mill was because we kept going up and down with Brighton, so we were always in the same division. Whereas Charlton and Millwall yeah. sort of got out of sync. And let's face it, now you know Millwall have been in the Championship for quite a long time, as long as we've been in the Premier League. Charlton are now in League One, so it's sort of taken that proximity away, and that's led to, I think, the lessening of the rivalry for today's fans. And yeah. Brighton have become that, you know. And, the, and say there are multiple reasons, um, and we're not here to go into the reason why Brighton, uh, for some people, are considered our main rivals. Uh, but I'm with you. I, I think it's a brilliantly run club. Um, Bloom's done a, an incredible job. They seem to be able to replace their players, their managers, their coaching staff like that, which not many clubs can achieve. And certainly Palace has struggled. Um, yeah. Going back to, um, yeah, January 1969. So, as you rightly point out, there, there weren't many goals. In fact, it was a goal was drawn. Did you... Do you remember it being boring or did you just love the fact you were amongst 30 odd thousand people watching? Oh, I loved every, I loved every minute of it. I loved every minute of it. Um, you know, the, it, the fact that it was nil-nil, 
I don't remember being disappointed. Uh, I remember being disappointed I couldn't go to the replay. And I remember being very disappointed that we lost the replay. Um, yeah. But no, it was just, uh, I was thrilled to have been there and to have experienced it. And then um, the same with the home, the first home game, you know, I, I was really exciting. It was, it was incredibly exciting. And again, frustrating that it was nil nil that one. I think I was more frustrated by that. But then the yeah. joy of us winning that next day on April the 5th, uh, 3-1, which put us really in with four games left, I think, with a great yeah. shout of promotion. It really was like, okay, this is for real now. We've had a fantastic yeah. run of victories. Um, and seeing three goals, and I, I think they were at the end. I, I was standing in the homestead for that game. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw at least two goals at that end. It was immensely exciting. And then I was at the final game when we got promoted, the Fulham game, the 3-2 yeah. game, which was one of the greatest games I've been to. You know, we were 2-0 down at half time, then came back to win 3-2 and were promoted and the place went mental. And I was literally, I've got pictures. I took old Polaroids size picture of the ground. And I was, I think, the last person to leave the stage. It was just <laughs> literally empty and the pitch was bald, completely bald because yeah. there's grass left on it. And you you can't see anybody in the picture. I think there's maybe one groundsman or something. Um, I, I was, again, I went with a school friend, and I think my aunt took us as well she came. Um, but that was one of the great, great days of, of my life. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you kept those pictures? I do. I, I, they, I posted them on the BBS years ago, and they pop up all over the internet now. Uh, mm -hmm. Pictures of this, this sort of barren thing and... Um, I don't think I've got any pictures of every, the pitch invasion, which I didn't take part in. Uh, I was far too well behaved. Uh, I was just enjoying observing it. Brilliant. You must send me the pictures. We can use that to uh, accentuate the pod because I'd, I'd love to see those. So looking at this, Jim, there's, there's a bit of a theme to it. So you say you got, um, obviously, the World Cup, you know, is all con consuming, and particularly when you're at your age, it's in England. England yeah. eventually win the World Cup, but your first game nil all against Uruguay. Your first live game at the Valley nil all. Your next game Middlesbrough nil all. Some people would have possibly even put off the idea that these three games didn't actually feature one goal, which is, let's face it, the point of football. But you said, no, 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 I'm here and I'm here for life. And I, I love that devotion. So, as you say, you were rewarded when you went the following day after the Middlesbrough game, saw the speed Portsmouth 3-1 and everything was rosy in the garden. I will point out, actually, going back to the FA Cup, I, I, I have actually, I don't know if you, do. You, were you a memorabilia collector? Did you have Programs yeah, I've got, I've got all sorts of Palace memorabilia. All, most of it's in LA, but uh, not here in London. Yeah. But... Well, I don't know if you ever got a program from that original game, but I've got yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I, I do have that? Yeah, I've got it. I've got it here. I've, all my programs are here in London, in the flat in London. So yeah, that I've got. It's it's great, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah, uh, that's it, uh, fantastic. It, it is a it's a fantastic snapshot as well uh, i've done this a lot of times so i've always tried to locate the program that's great if a guest hasn't got the program i'll send it to them but you've got it so i'll keep this as a memento yes. but when you flick through it that there, there, there is some really interesting stuff so for example both managers get a little forward not just Fermani, who is the Charlton manager, but also Bert had the Palace manager. And in the Fermani Charlton one, he talks about welcoming Palace and what a, you know, it's great that both South London clubs are together. So this rivalry thing, there wasn't, it, it just feels nice. And I think in the elsewhere in the programme, they say, it's a pity we're meeting Palace in the third round. We'd like to have met them in the final, you know. That yeah, wouldn't yeah. really happen nowadays, would it? They wouldn't say, oh, yeah, we'd love to have met them in the final. The, 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 there is a bit more animosity, let's say. Oh, so, it, was definitely, it was definitely a friendly rivalry, no question. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, also, I look back on this, and, you know, with your run of goalless draws, 
And Bert Head says, well, we're expecting a really fantastic game because the previous league game between Palace and Charlton, which was at Salas Park, just happened to be a three-all draw. But Jim Piddock was there and he's not going to stop. He's, he's stopping all that goal nonsense. Yeah, so, yeah. It, and there are some lovely pen portraits in here uh, which go into incredible detail about... Right. So they talk about John Jackson. Okay, we're going to look at the players now. And yeah, yeah. John Jackson was our goalkeeper and, you know, hundreds of games for the club. It said um, he's very keen on inverted commas fishing, which I don't understand why that's inverted commas. And it's very handy because he lives in Hove, so he can do a lot of fishing. Now, that's the sort of detail that you don't get nowadays in a programme. I love that, an insight into John Jackson's fishing. But let, let's yeah. let's look at the, the teams then. So John Jackson, great start. Goalkeeper, what do you remember of him? Uh, he was one of my favourite players. I loved John Jackson. I was really upset when he left and went to Orient, Lake Orient. Yeah. I have a signed, uh, framed, signed photo of John Jackson in LA on, on the wall. Um, nice. I, I, I thought he was the unluckiest goalkeeper really in history English history to have been born at a time when there were so many great goalkeepers because he was easily good enough to play for England he kept Palace up you know in the first division in those days single-handedly you know uh, I mean on occasions he, he, we were under the gun almost all the time he was an extraordinary goalkeeper and seemed like a really uh, decent fellow uh, I was very sad to see he passed away I think last year um, certainly within the last two years. Um, uh, and I remember reading an article, he wasn't just into fi fishing. I mean, nowadays people would read into that, you know, oh, it lives in Brighton, into fishing, oh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, it, it would be, but it was um, totally innocent, I know. And, uh, and, mm. But I, I, I remember him saying he, he suffered from post-match nerves, not pre-match nerves. He never got mm. nervous before a game, but there was, he would be pacing his house uh, in Brighton, he lived in Brighton, yeah. Um, yeah. He pacing his house at 4 a.m. after a game because he, I guess the adrenaline was still going and he couldn't, yeah. he couldn't let it go. He would go over the match in his head. So he suffered from post-match kind of nerves, not pre-match, which was really quite unusual. But then when I became an actor, I sort of understood that to a degree, although I suffered more from pre-performance nerves. But how... I, I, you know, physically, I, when I've played a night game, playing football too, I can't get to sleep till one or two in the morning because your adrenaline is still pumping. So I understood that <clears throat> finally when I was an adult. But it was fascinating to me reading that when I was a, a, a kid um, or a young teen, that, that that's what he, he, he suffered from. But I loved Jacko and I think he was, again, I remember having a, ba a banner. I went to a Chelsea away game in the cup, I think it was, not and I had a, made a banner, Jackson for England, that my, my friends and I took, and I, we were allowed to display it. I don't think it got confiscated. So, But all that team, I mean, I'm looking now at that team here where they've got Jackson in goal, and there was David Payne, who I really loved in midfield, who's still around, and you see at Palace quite a bit. Yeah, I see him in the main stand. He, he's still yeah. Playing, yeah. John Laughlin, who I believe is no longer with us. Roger Hoy, who then emigrated and became a religious minister, I think. Uh, and I don't think he's with us anymore. John McCormick died uh, yeah. really recently. John McCormick was another, I thought he was, we used to call him Craggy. He had this brilliant Scottish Craggy face. And he was fantastic. Uh, stalwart for Palace. Then Mel Blythe who uh, was alongside him, who was quite glamorous. He was the sort of opposite. He was kind of blonde, long blonde hair and glamorous. Like bouffant hair, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was kind of like a playboy looks. And I, <laughs> sadly, again, I think he passed away recently. Uh, yeah. Mark Lazarus was a was, was great little player. And I saw him. I went to an Orient game because I had nothing to do about 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. And... Um, immediately recognised him outside the ground and introduced oh, wow. himself and we had a long chat. Um, he looked almost exactly the same, just older. Uh, and there was Steve Kemba, who again was uh, on balance, probably my favourite player. Steve Kemba was the star of that team. He was, and then went to Chelsea. 
and then obviously has a huge history with Palace, came back. Cliff Jackson up front was was very, very good forward and replaced really when we got promotion by um, Jerry Queen. Bobby Woodruff was an old stalwart who scored absolutely vital goals. The, the one I remember most was that season was um, we beat Derby County away, who Derby were top. Yeah. Uh, uh, we beat Derby 1-0 away um, about two months after I went to that for my first game. It was in my early March. And he wow. scored the only goal, I believe. I believe it was Bobby Woodruff. And that was really the turning point. Once we'd beaten the top team 1-0 away, you knew yeah. that we were on a, a run. Then the other two players were Colin Taylor, who's a very, very solid player, and Terry Long, who uh, at that point was the longest-serving Palace player. We'd been yeah. there for years and years and uh, was replaced ultimately by um, Jim Cannon in terms of longevity. Mm. That was, and I don't know if Terry's still with us. It's possible, but I mean, it makes me sad to think, you know, that all, all these heroes of mine, uh, so many have gone. Yeah. The World Cup, to that 1966 World Cup team, Jeff Hurst is the only survivor. The only one. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes me very, very sad. Um, they were all heroes, you know. Sure. Um, yeah, Terry Long, nominative determinism there as the longest serving. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, and Jim he played in a, a lot I of think people. it was interesting that there was suddenly this Scottish influx, wasn't there? Yeah, uh, so McCormick, Lachlan, I think Hoy, Taylor, they were Scott, and then we've had this long run of great Scottish players, as you say, Jim Cannon, yep. uh, Dougie Friedman. Um, you know, it, it goes all the way through to. Yogi Berra, who's only just retired, you know that they're they I don't know why, but I I'm married to a Scot, so I'm quite pleased to say that there's there is this Scottish brethren. But there was something about having Scottish players at that time. It, it weirdly seemed almost exotic because there were so many. You know, it's basically British homegrown players, but the Scots were a slightly different breed. You say. I love the fact that John McCormick's nickname is Craggy, which is a great Scottish, you know, it just sums him up, doesn't it? And it, it, you immediately see John McCormick. If you say. And I I think that it, it does help you understand the world a bit. When you start following football and you get obsessed with it, like you and I have done, it opens up things, and, and I've said this before, and I've discussed this before with Poker. Geography, for example, your geography improves massively because of yeah. the World Cup. You know where you, you look at the teams, you know what the flag looks like, you know yeah. the national colours, and on it goes. And similarly, just in England, you know, you, if you travel away, you find out actually where Barnsley is or where Grimsby is. So this is the it's it's an education. I know some people will be going, this guy is now totally bullshitting, but it is an education. It just well, happens do you to need to know where Grimsby is, is the question. <laughs> well, I've, I've been there a couple of times and probably not, but, um, you know, it's in Cleethorpe, strangely, the, the ground. But um, I, I just think it does open up an opportunity. It When you're a youngster also, are you that keen on learning? Probably not, but you love learning about football. You love learning about all the teams. You love learning about all the players. And that, yeah. therefore, opens up your brain and actually activates it. So, you know, people say, oh, stop spending so much time obsessing about it. No, actually, I'm not going to do that. Strangely, I get more obsessed and more upset when we lose and more later when we win now in my 60s than I did when I was probably in my 20s. But, you know, that's probably age um, doing its tricks. 